my name is Leon. I'm the moderator for the session. So if you have any uh, questions, technical uh, questions during the session, feel free to ask them in the chat. And without any further ado, I will give the stage to Nadine now and to Michael. Thank you very much. Um, also, a warm welcome from my side. Um, great that you're here. I will now start sharing my screen and I hope that you will be able to see our presentation because it's always a little finicky with with the screen sharing I've tried in the practice run. But at the moment I'm only seeing gray, so I will try once again. Now it works for me, I hope it now also works for you. Um, great, um, so without further delay, Welcome to this presentation. I'm Nadine Linschinger. I'm an Open Education Manager at the University of Graz. And I'm here today together with Michael Kopp, the second speaker. He is the head of our Center for Digital Teaching and Learning here at the University of Graz, Austria. And we are here with our open education policy practice and support um, models that we have developed here in Graz in the past few years. So today we want to share with you the building blocks that we have developed that devise a comprehensive open education strategy at a higher education institution that is our context. And we will share our experience from our university as well as a little broader the experience of open education um, efforts in the entirety of Austria. But before we dive into the building blocks themselves, I want to give the word to Michael because he will introduce our approach and our realistic view and on OER and also what challenges we face when encouraging people to use more open education in their practice. Oh, uh, thank you, Nadine, and hi, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for your interest in the talk. Well, um, let me start uh, by talking about some general things regarding our approach to open educational resources. Uh, we think that OER are awesome, of course, but um, and also it's very important uh, to promote OER and to spread the topic among colleagues. However, we also see that when promoting OER, we often overlook or even ignore the challenges that come with them. We believe it's very important that these challenges are not kept quiet. After all, they are not a burden, but can help us find functioning solutions. So that are some of the bullet points here you can see at the moment. Um, because ignoring the challenges, uh, this won't help. Uh, and but ignoring challenges is not a new phenomenon. Uh, from my uh, experience with e-learning, I've seen that uh, when new technologies are introduced, only a few people are interested at first. But uh, when we promote the possibilities that come with these technologies, more people uh, get involved. Um, however, many lose interest again when they face obstacles that were not addressed during the promotion phase. As we know in science, the more we know, the more questions we have. And of course, this is also true for OER. And this can be seen quite clearly, for example, in our OER trainings. Because during these trainings, it's crucial for us to highlight the challenges then to present solutions, but also acknowledge that some challenges don't have solutions yet. So we have to find the right solutions for concrete problems uh, that uh, we face uh, during our, our OER processes. Um, adopting and creating OER will take time for many people and of course also for most of university teachers. Um, but we think we can speed up this process, not only by promoting OER, but also by being transparent about uh, the associated challenges. 
So we think the best way to get everyone on board is to actively work on problem solving, to communicate solutions, and to create the best, possi the best possible conditions uh, for OER implementation. And how this going to work, uh, I'm sure Nadine will show us now by using the University of Graz as an example. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you very much, um, Michael. So as you heard, there are many obstacles that come up, particularly with, with training people and informing them about the topic and then being the person who then gets all the questions back and all the insecurities back. So um, we found that when you try to implement OER and try to build a strategy that is really useful all over the higher education institution, you have to look at different building blocks. And we have now brought six of them as an example. And before I dive into them, I just want to say you are welcome to to share questions at the end of the presentation. We have planned time for this, but it is also possible if something is really confusing while I'm talking to just type that in the chat. So um, we said we want to focus on support measures, on workflows, on policy and strategy, on staff qualification, on technical infrastructure and promotion today very briefly, because we think that you need more than just a piece of paper that says we now love OER and want to implement it at the university, you need comprehensive measures. It is not a singular effort to, to say or to implement OER, but you need to involve different stakeholders. You need to involve teachers as well as other staff members, administrative staff, IT staff, management staff, and so on, to get everyone on board of this OER or open education even journey. So with support measures, we mean consultations, tutorials, workshops, even written instructions that you give people to explain what this OER idea is even about. At the University of Graz, we have, we have workshops, we have a website um, on OER and dedicated Moodle courses where we inform people on all things um, digital teaching and now particularly with a focus on OER so that everyone can get the information they need. With workflows, we mean dedicated processes that you need for OER consultations and also OER production. So who is responsible, who's doing what, whom can you contact and so on. And here in Graz at the moment, we are working um, on developing such a workflow that works for everyone. And later in the presentation, I will show you which guiding questions we use for that and which um, steps in the workflow we find useful. With policy and strategy, we mean that there should be an official paper lying around somewhere where there is a commitment of management of the rectorate or someone higher up that OER should be promoted because when you have it in writing, when you have a policy, a strategy paper, you just have the security that there is commitment. Um, with staff qualification, we refer to OER courses, OER trainings that actually tell the staff how to use OER because it's not enough to just say, use it, you also need to tell them what the implications of this are. So what are the legal implications? What about copyright? What about CC licenses? How do they work? And what is the vision behind OER even? Why do we want to use OER? So this is also a topic that we will dive in a little bit more in detail later. Technical infrastructure is something that doesn't have to be the biggest point from the beginning. There are already many repositories online where you could up upload your OER. And I know that in some countries there are also national efforts where there is an OER repository that everyone, um, every school, university can use. Um, here in Austria, we have the way at the moment that um, all the universities on their own develop repositories. And then there is a higher um, repository called the OER Hub, which is a meta repository that um, sums up everything that is um, located in the in the local repositories of each university. So for us, that was also a building block developing our own repository. 
Um, we have that online now, the OER portal from UniGrads, but we are still in a little bit of a more beta phase or testing phase, but in the next few months we want to to step up promotion and, and get it out there. And this brings me to the last building block, promotion. All the efforts I've just mentioned don't mean anything if no one knows about them. So it is important to get the idea out there via websites, um, social media, newsletters, posters, flyers, workshops, events, so that people get to know what you're doing and get to know how great the idea is of opening education for all. So now that I've talked about all these building blocks in brief, I want to highlight those three workflows, policy, strategy and staff qualification, because we will dive into them a little bit more right now and tell you how exactly we are doing this at the University of Graz. So starting with policy. The OER policy that we have is our biggest strategic measure of implementing open education. In 2020, um, the University of Graz has implemented an OER policy, and with that, we've been Austria's first university who has done so. Um, now there are some more who have already also gotten their own OER policy. And our OER policy enables and recommends even the use, production, and publication of OERs. What that means is that it gives teachers the security um, of allowing kind of the the open publication of their material and also encourages them to do so. It also includes the commitment um, to offering support services so that there will be a spot somewhere where people will sit and will help and will support the development of open education. So this is also a really important commitment, um, including media production services, consultation services, um, the OER portal that I just mentioned and so on. And our OER policy is also anchored in the two um, most important documents that the university has for um, its development and financial situation. So the university development plan and the performance agreement with the Ministry of Education, where we also dedicate um, a section to the OER policy and its importance. And from this policy and from the idea that is on paper somewhere, we said that we need to move on and develop workflows how we will really use um, these um, OER ideas and um, what the way of anchoring it really at the university will be. So the first step for this we would recommend is that there needs to be a department, a service unit, institute or a person who is entrusted with the task of um, getting all the OER questions um, and combining all the OER services of the university. So here with us, it is um, the Center for Digital Teaching and Learning, where we to um, work, and the person who is responsible for developing the next steps together with other stakeholders is the Open Education Manager, which is me at the moment. And we work closely together with other departments, be it the legal department, the IT department, and so on, to anchor OER everywhere where it's necessary. We in our department also carry out OER trainings, which I will mention later again. And we are right now working on specifying the workflows and the guiding questions that we need to be able to, to get the next steps out there regarding OER. So, um, and as soon as we have that done, our next idea is that we want to disseminate the information about everything I just said across the university and also to look at evaluation and quality assurance workflows because it's not enough to just put the OER out there. Of course, you also need to make sure that what you put out there is, um, doesn't have any copyright infringements, is quality-wise okay and good because it also reflects the people and the university um, if you put it out somewhere. And to get that a little bit more um, understandable and specific, I've brought a sample OER workflow. So this is um, how this process could look like. Um, the best way to start is with a contact point. So um, you need the information who should the teachers contact when they want something with open education? Is it a person? Is it a service point? How can you contact them? Is there an email address? Is there an inquiry form on a website? Is there a phone number to call? 
if it's a phone number to call, make sure that someone is sitting on the other side of this phone line and can actually give the information out that the teachers need. So establishing the point of contact is really important so that the questions land where they should land. And then when you have built the contact and the teachers are in touch with the support department, the consultation mode needs to be, fine, be defined. So what will you actually do for and with the teachers? Will there be only discussion about OER and CC licenses and how they work? Or will you even offer content creation? So will you offer production of OER? Um, that mostly applies maybe to um, audio or video productions because that is something that cannot be done as well on your own. And if you offer this, um, that maybe also there will be the question of billing. Um, we here at the Center for Digital Teaching and Learning have three media producers for the university, but not all of them are dedicated to OER specifically, but some resources are, so we can offer some OER production, but it is not um, wholly dedicated to OER yet. And regarding the question in the chat, we also have not um, hired a lawyer that is only responsible for OER at the moment. Maybe we can um, talk about that later as well because the legal implications are still a big insecurity for teachers. And if applicable, it is also good to have the things that you talked with the teachers in writing. So um, written agreements on what will happen and the most important thing, a consent form for the publication is OER because you need their consent that the product you produce is not or they produce, then it's on their own, but if you produce it for them, that it is not under copyright, but that they explicitly consent that it will be published in an open way under a CC license and that they know what this means, that they cannot use copyrighted content in their slides, for example, if they want to have it as an open educational resource. Then the next steps would be actual production. So um, creating the learning object um, with the teacher, with the service point, verifying it, paying attention to copyright and so on. And then with the publication, the real question is, um, will, you will you publish it? Do you have your own platform of the university? Will the teacher publish it? Do you simply have to send it to them via we transfer something? And who will actually be responsible for the published um, OER? And then we recommend to follow up all this with evaluation, evaluating the processes. So developing quality, quality assurance, using the chance of actually collecting data, surveying people, download rates, ETC, so that you just use this information and can then um, modify your processes or even show the success of your OER efforts. And to find someone who actually produces these OER, um, OER training is required. So you see our OER cat on the slide, the cateur, which is our uh, OER mascot, who leads people through our training efforts, which is the MOOC using and creating OERs. You find this MOOC on iMOOCs. Um, dot at slash course slash oer mooc unfortunately it's only in german at the moment but it is published as an oer itself so you will find um, the four units introduction searching and finding oers creating oers and the oer project um, on the mooc and it consists of learning videos tran transcripts for accessibility additional materials form quizzes and so on so that everyone can get the best learning experience on their own. We have had 407 participants in the last year from March 22 to February 23. And I'm particularly happy to um, report that we have a 44% completion rate, which is quite high for a MOOC. But that's probably the case because many universities have used this MOOC for the mandatory OER qualification processes that they have developed. And our qualification process is our guided OER training program that we have developed um, with 25 work hours workload or one ECTS. And we have had 75 participants in the last year. It is built on an active blended learning approach. That means we have self-learning phases, we have synchronous sessions, we have asynchronous assignments. We use peer feedback to get the best learning experience. And we have guiding and coaching throughout the project. 
So um, to make that more visually understandable, our training program consists of three steps, a fast synchronous session, which then is followed up by the finding OER's part of the MOOC. So what are CC licenses, where to find OER, what is it even? Then we have a second synchronized session followed up by creating OERs, um, the MOOC units, and some more tasks regarding legal aspect, publishing, license combining, and so on. And then we have a third synchronous session and the publication of OERs. And this consists also of an OER practice report, of an OER project plan, and of the publication of three OERs that the people themselves develop. And when this publication is complete, people also get a certificate that is issued by um, the Forum for New Media and Teaching Austria. So it's issued by an external um, body who certifies um, all the OER practitioners, as we call them. And the forum does not do that alone, but they have um, a board of international experts who rate um, all these guiding, all these training programs and rate the quality of it. And then teachers actually get this Austria wide certificate of OER practitioner. And together, all these OER measures play into each other. So we have the OER policy that outlines a, str a strategy, as I said, you. We have the staff training offers that qualifies our people who can then upload their things on the OER portal and publish it. We can exchange knowledge in the Open Education Austria program that is also part of the MOOC and the training program. So we've not done that on our own, but together with the Open Education Austria Advanced Project. And then we offer here at the center ongoing support and encourage use and creation of OER, which brings us back up to our OER policy. Um, that is the beginning and the end now of the presentation, as well as of our strategy at the moment. I have seen that the MOOC has been posted in the forum. Thank you very much for this. And with this, I'm already ending the talk. Um, we hope that this talk has been a little bit of an idea giver or an inspiration for you and for other institutions um, to follow your vision of providing quality education for all. As we know, um, open education is supposed to be equitable, inclusive, open and participatory for all. So we want to foster this. So thank you very much. Feel free to email us, to add us on LinkedIn with the QR code. You also find the digital teaching and learning website um, from UniGraz. Um, looking forward for you, to your questions. We have seven more minutes in this room. And then also we have the networking table. So if anything is um, out in the open, just go ahead. I'm really looking forward to a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine and Michael. I already saw that there was a big round of applause already. Um, so we already have uh, one question in the chat from Leon Wittmeier. Uh, do you have dedicated lawyers for questions regarding OER? Michel, do you want to go ahead with the legal aspect? Uh, well, I try to. Uh, the thing is, uh, unfortunately, no. We don't have uh, lawyers that uh, really experienced with the legal issues concerning OER. Um, the thing is that um, our loyal department, uh, legal department gets more and more involved in this, but we see also that there is, um, well, they, they, they need to uh, get a more experience on it because the topic of OER is not that widespread uh, in, in, at our university as it could be at the moment, but we are working on that. And I'm sure that uh, during the next month or even years, uh, there will be some experts uh, who are dealing with uh, legal issues as well at our university. Thank you. I can also see that um, Sasha is asking whether we are satisfied with the demand. Um, we have we have different target groups. So we have people who show up all the time. We call that, them in German um, lovingly Stammgäste. So they are very interested, very um, very forthcoming with their ideas, and they are and also very supportive and and all in there. But there is also a big target group we are not reaching. 
So we are often reaching the people who are particularly motivated and who want to do that intrinsically, um, but we are not reaching the broad masses at the moment. So that is our next um, goal, actually, to, to get it out there in, in broader daylight. Um, to give numbers, I think we um, I have qualified with the guiding program that I um, described um, and 39. 39. 30, 39. <laughs> so um, that is not nothing, but it is for our staff of three or four four thousand um, people at the university, not so much yet. So it has been the first year. We hope it will grow. And that's about uh, a workload of uh, 25 hours. And this is really uh, a huge workload for people who are uh, teaching all the time and uh, are also scientists, of course. And we always uh, tell them at the beginning of uh, our trainings that this will need 25 hours of work to uh, go through the whole program, the training program. Uh, most of our colleagues don't believe uh, they really need 25 hours. Uh, well, in fact, most of them need more than 25 hours to complete the program. Um, that means that uh, some of them just uh, don't have the time to finish uh, our training. So, yeah, that's one reason why we at the moment have only 39 uh, participants who uh, finished uh, the trainings yeah it is a really um it is it is a debate that we are also having regarding our oer portal um i've sent the link also in the chat who should be able to upload there because we we want the things up there to be correct and and to have high quality also regarding the oer use but on the other hand you can't force people to spend so much time um on training programs before being able to upload things so the question how much time do you really need to be able to understand cc licenses and should this be a requirement for using oer or not is really out in the open right now we are now leaning more towards um, shorter information um, slides or courses but we think that it is really um, important to get the people to give the people something because CC licenses, combining things, all the copyright issues is not so easy to, to understand if you haven't heard of it before. Yes, so Leon Wittmeyer was just adding that uh, from his experience, people don't have time for that. Um, so are there any other questions right now? If so, please feel free to either write them in the chat or to raise your hand, then we can also and give you speakers rights and you can ask your questions verbally if you prefer that for me it is also um interesting to hear that people have similar experiences and that is familiar to them that the issue is um similar everywhere and the the efforts are also um going the same direction and we have the same obstacles so i hope um, some of our experience could be helpful and I also would like to hear at the networking table maybe what what has helped you or what maybe we could also do differently would be really interesting. <laughs> Chat pain. <laughs> that is hopefully not the last word of this, um, of this um, talk but I definitely share the pain but we also share the joy of trying to promote the vision of open education so that may be the the positive side of all this thank you for being here anyway and for for sharing your thoughts and for listening to ours it was a pleasure yeah my pleasure too thanks a lot for your interest and for being here